Double 4 is a game that's hardly recognizable from its original state. So many things have changed, the systems have been updated, the classes have constantly balanced, everything's totally different. And then to add seasonal elements on top of that, there's a lot to keep up with and a lot to catch up to if you're just now joining. And Sanctuary just got a whole bunch of brand new souls headed to the gates of hell to join us in the fight against Lilith. In this beginner's guide, we're going through all of it. Codexes, blacksmiths, upgrading paths, itemization, Hell tides, boss summoning, all of it. New returning players, Decker Kane said it best with Stay a while and listen. Let's get into it. Now with this guide, it is going into everything, absolutely everything. See the time codes below. Time codes will guide you through each of the individual chapters for the stuff I'm going over. All right, so a character creation is a big step in any game that you're playing, especially ARPGs. Because you're playing more than just a build. An entire class has a whole range of resources available to it for you to be able to take on all the challenges that await you in the game. Now, when it comes to Diablo 4, you got five choices. You're going to have Barbarian, Druid, Sorcerer, Necromancer, and Rogue. All these classes have a very distinct play style. Really the best way to experience it is just to go in there and play each one of them. In the description, I'm gonna link a build guide for Barbarian, Sorcerer, and Necromancer in the description below. For Barbarian, we got the Weapon Master that's gonna be cycling through a set of weapons that's gonna hit things with a hammer and do tons of damage. For the Necromancer, we got the Exploding Blood Surge build that's gonna be able to blow up everything on the screen using blood magic. And then finally, for the sorcerer, we're gonna have the lightning ball sorcerer that's just really strong for taking out mobs of enemies with pulsing lightning. All those are gonna be linked in the description below. Now I'm gonna show you a handy way on how you can actually see a build guide while you're in the game with today's sponsor. This is a perfect tool for new players and the best part is it's completely free and could not be simpler to set up. I'm partnered with Mobilytics here on the channel. I have all of my build guides posted on Mobilytics website and you can access them in the description and also through their handy overlay where you can actually see in game to be able to go step by step through your build guide to be able to strengthen your character with minimal downtime on your gameplay. This overlay here is such a win for any players looking to get into Diablo and they want to be able to pull up all their information on the screen right in front of them over their game without having to minimize. Use it to find your favorite build and get your character as powerful as possible today. Thank you once again to Mobilytics for sponsoring this video. The first thing we're going to go over here today is actually a setting that's the most important thing to take a look at when you first begin in Diablo. In fact, to this day, it baffles me that this isn't a default setting. And with default settings, you're missing out on a lot of information about your gear. So this is what, what it looks like by default. If you press shift, you could actually see both your equipped item and also the item you picked up in your inventory. There's no way for us to know the range in which these attributes can be rolled. Like what is the maximum amount of attack speed I could possibly roll on the hands there? Well, there's settings for each one of, ones of those and by default, they are turned off. So if we wanted to turn them on, we'll have to go into options, gameplay, and head over to advanced tooltip compare and then advanced tooltip information. If you click both of those on, we're going to get both of those added to our gear. So now when we go into our inventory, we're going to see that we have not only the damage per second is going to get the plus modifier next to it, but also too, whenever we look at each of those individual attributes, we're going to see not only the how much it's increasing, but also the range in which it could have rolled. So let's look at the second one for example 26 percent damage to close enemies that can roll from a 19 percent to a 26 percent so we got actually the max roll on this stat in particular and i can see it's a 5.6 percent increase on my stat from what i currently have equipped and it's crazy to think that i wouldn't know any of that if i didn't have this setting clicked on in my settings and also too it's important to know when you get those max rolls because for example if you take a look over here at my imprinted piece. So this is a legendary that I imprinted an aspect onto. It shows me the role in which I had. So if I find a legendary that has perhaps a 100% role, and that did happen to me, I might want to imprint that, or I might want to extract that aspect and then save it for later when I find it. Now, what do, exactly do I mean by that? In Diablo 4, there's a color coding to the items that you find. So when you find something that's white, it means it has no affixes on it. That means nothing that's gonna be buffing the damage or the stats on the item. Blue, it has a couple of them. Rare, more affixes than 
one, the blue one does. And then finally, the orange legendary items are gonna have like a special legendary affix to it. For example, barbarians can find this affix up here that's gonna make, make their hammer move, be able to radiate a shockwave out that's gonna turn it into an AOE attack instead of making it focused on just a small area of effect. Now, finding this kind of thing is really cool, but there's a codex system that's gonna allow you to save these affixes. And as you find better gear, you can imprint these affixes, these legendary affixes on new rare items that you find that might be better than the legendary one you found. In Diablo, it's not only important that we understand this system, but we, we need to understand when to use it and how to avoid some major pitfalls that'll end up setting your character behind. I'm doing a Hammer of the Ancients build, and this right here is a pivotal aspect that I need to use for my build to be able to function. Notice right here, the item actually rolled the highest possible value on the legendary affix. What I want to do is to be able to take this aspect and put it on another item. Let's talk about the Occultist and how the Occultist can help you apply these to your gear. So if you're in Koyovashad, head on over to Demian the Occultist. We step on over here and open up the imprint aspect menu. We see that we get a couple options here. First, we're going to have an item that we can put up here. This is the item we want to inherit the legendary affixes. We get a couple options below it where it's codex of power and aspect from inventory. First, let's talk about codex. Codex is basically the lowest possible value rolled on an affix. Now you might be wondering, why would I want to apply the lowest possible value? Well, what's great about this is that we're able to get these as guaranteed rewards by running certain dungeons. This aspect of ancestral force, I was able to get from running the sunken ruins up here. And I was able to get that legendary affix very early on in my build. Over here, you can see that if you run this dungeon, you would get the aspect of the relentless arms master. So there's a lot of aspects out there waiting for you to get. For some of the aspects, you have to find the legendary before you're able to use it on another piece of gear. Now, let's go back over here and look at the occultist again. So once again, I ran that dungeon. So I have this codex, which means I can apply it to any piece of gear at any time, whenever I want. So for example, say I wanted to have this codex, I could apply it to one of my weapons right here. And then the preview down here is what you would get after you did this combination. Keep in mind, there's a material cost and also a gold value that you have to pay as well, whatever you're doing this crafting. So you can think of the Codex of Power as an option to get your build up and running if you didn't find the power on a random drop. If we wanted to transfer the legendary roll we got on an item, notice that we can't just take our legendary item and put it in the aspect slot. What we have to do first is we have to go over to the Aspect Extract tab. And then by putting the item in here, we're then able to make an aspect like this here, and then it's going to turn it into an item for us to use. And we can find that over here in our Aspects tab. And now if we would go back to this over here, we can now put that aspect into the slot and now, if we wanted to, we could put our weapon up here and then we would be able to use the max roll of the affix on the mace. This would be a huge mistake. And the reason for that is that you can only imprint an aspect once. So once you make this new item down here, you're not able to take that item and then place it back in the aspect uh, extract tab and take out the aspect again to apply it to something else. So every time we want to apply an aspect, we're going to have to extract it, apply it, and then that's as far as it can go. We can't do it again. So basically, every time I want to apply this offensive aspect of ancestral force, I have two options. I can either apply the minimum value from the codex or I can find one of these legendaries that has one of the roles that rolls this legendary affix. All right, so that's how we can transfer power from one item to another. But I wanna take this one step further and show you how you can get more out of transferring your aspects. If you're paying very close attention, you might've noticed when I put the aspect over here, we get a much lower value than we had it when we had it on the item. No, extracting the imprint did not lower the value. We actually reduced it by half because we're applying this to a one-handed mace. So we get a multiplier based on the item that we're imprinting. This would just be at a 100% value of the base aspect. 
I hope that's not too confusing, but let me explain it in a different way here. So let's look at another example. So our one-handed weapons are 100% of the aspect. So it's just gonna be one times the aspect. We actually get a two times multiplier if we use a two-handed weapon. So when I put the aspect in here, notice it jumps up to 100%. The bottom end goes from 32 to 64, and the top end goes from 50 to 100. So we wanna make sure we're choosing carefully which item slot we use for when we apply our aspects. Now, weapons are not the only place you can apply your aspects. Notice when we look at my character, my hands, amulet, rings, all highlighted because they all have their own ability to get aspects as well. So now let's take a look. If I put my wep my hands in here, I get 100% the value. If I put my ring in here, we get 100% the value. If I put my amulet in here, this is where it gets a little bit different. We actually get one and a half times the value, right? So we get half of it added in. So instead of it being 200% applied, it's 150% of the value. So wrapping it all up, these aspects, when you get a roll that's at the top end of the value, you want to save this for an item you're going to be using for a long time. Now, of course, you're going to have these token affixes that are going to be in your inventory that you can save and apply to gear the same way as I just mentioned on the codex system. Now, you can actually browse the available codexes and then also pick the ones that you don't have yet and then target those on your map to be able to know which dungeons that you can go to to be able to get those affixes added to, to your collection. So if you want to take a look Look at the codexes that you have you can hit the y button and then take a look at your codex of power this is going to list out all the codexes that you found so far now if you're taking a look at the ones you haven't earned just yet and you find one that you really want to use you can actually pin it on your map even if you haven't discovered the area just yet and you can see that it'll actually pin the location of the dungeon on my map even if like in this character's case it is in an undiscovered area, you still will get the map pin exactly where the dungeon is. It's super handy for finding whatever you need. Now, appending these unique affixes onto the end of our rares is not the only way that we can improve our gear. We can actually go over to the blacksmith where we can salvage our gear and then use what we salvage from the gear that we don't need to be able to upgrade our current gear that we want. But there's an important part to it that's called an item level breakpoint. If you notice- So if we're in Kyovishad, we can head over to Zivik, the blacksmith. First, we have the salvage, which is, this is something you may be familiar with where you can clear out your items, gain some reagents to be able to use later in other crafting options. Also, we can repair our gear. Finally, this is the one we're gonna be focusing on today, upgrade weapons and armor. Now, it's important for us to know that items all have an item power associated with it. This is gonna determine the strength of the weapon. As you level and your character gets stronger, you're gonna find higher item power items now that's not the only way that we can increase an item power. We're gonna be able to increase the item power of a particular item on this upgrade menu. Now let's take a closer look. You drop a weapon up in here or an item and you're able to upgrade it to gain some stats. Now let's talk about what you gain each time you upgrade. Each time you upgrade an item, you gain 10% gain of its stats and also increase its item power by five for each upgrade. Rare items can be upgraded a total of three times and legendary items can be upgraded four times. Now, if you upgrade an item from a rare to a legendary, you can upgrade it the fourth time after you apply a legendary affix. Now, at this point, we can talk about what item power breakpoints are. If we take this weapon, for example, these three affixes roll within a range stated on the item here. Just so you know, in your game, you'll have to turn on advanced tooltips for you to see this kind of range. I have a guide on that in the description if you want to take a look at that. But as you can see, for example, on the first one, damage to close enemies, we got a minimum roll. And then the third stat, we got a 62.4, which is actually the maximum roll for overpower damage. Now, it's important to know that the all of these affixes, the three appended affixes at the end here, these are going to have a range determined by the item power. There's stages for item powers that's going to determine the range that is given to the item and the possible stats that it can get on it. The point between two stages in item power is referred to as an item power breakpoint. We can actually cross the item power breakpoint by using the blacksmith. And there's a really interesting interaction with the weapon when it crosses that breakpoint through upgrades. Let's take a look at that now. 
And remember, the item power breakpoint and where we fall within the stages of item powers, that's going to determine the window or the range in which our stats can roll. If we take a look at this polearm here, we can see that we have an item power of 447. That's going to fall between the 340 to 459 bracket. Now, remember, we said that if we upgrade an item past the breakpoint, we're able to upgrade it to the new range and get a reroll on all the stats that came on the item. This is basically as if a new polearm with the exact same stats fell it dropped for you at a higher item level, it would just generate those stats again the same way it does when an item drops. So it gives us a new chance at rolling higher stats. We would get a reroll to damage to close enemies, damage over time, and overpower damage. As we've discussed, when we upgrade an item, it gains five item levels, and rare items are upgradable three times. That makes for 15 item levels. And we also are within 15 item levels of 460, so it is possible to re-roll this again to get new stats. So let's do it now. Our first upgrade is gonna just be the 10% that we talked about before. So we're gonna upgrade it once, and then again, the second one, a 10% upgrade again to those stats. Now, our third upgrade, if we take a look at the preview of what we're gonna get, notice, that we get a much larger upgrade because we're crossing the item level breakpoint. We're going to get a reroll on these stats and we're gonna see what we get coming out of it. You can use this to your advantage by saving gear that doesn't have the most optimal rolls on it, but did roll the stats you wanted. And this is where we can talk a little bit about the difficulty system in Diablo. So we're gonna have world tier one and two available to us immediately upon making our character. World tier two, I would suggest for players that have played ARPGs before, and then world tier one would be a better one to go if you're just brand new to the genre. So there's four different world tiers. Again, the first two are available immediately upon first character creation. There's gonna be scaling rewards with what you're able to get as you move up the world tiers, including completely new classes of gear, and the access to things like uber uniques and more. Something you're going to notice when you get into world tier three is that you're going to start getting sacred drops. Sacred drops are going to be indicated by in parentheses sacred being written next to the item name. Also, when you get into world tier four, you're also going to be getting ancestral drops. This is going to be indicated the same way with ancestral being written next to the item's name in parentheses. The only difference with these items is that they're going to be at a higher item level and have more stats on them. Basically, you want to make sure that in World Tier 3, you start replacing all your items with sacred pieces. And then in World Tier 4, you start replacing all your items with ancestral pieces. These are going to become the baseline items that you want to have in both of these world tiers. We'll get into all that in just a moment. You're not able to go into world tier three or four until you're around level 50. You have to complete something called a capstone dungeon before you can go into world tier three and then also another capstone dungeon before you can go into world tier four. And those are roughly going to be about level 50 and then level 75 is when you push into the final world tier. Now let's talk about characters in their first playthrough. The first time that you play the game, it's going to make you do the campaign up up through the prologue so this is going to be the first mission that you have where it introduces you to the big bad lilith after that you're able to skip the campaign if you choose to do it skipping the campaign is going to let you jump into this seasonal content and we'll talk about the seasonal specific stuff a little bit later as well but i just wanted you to know you have the option to skip the campaign if you wanted for your first playthrough the seasonal quest line is not going to be available to you until you complete the campaign or decide to skip the campaign however after completing the entire campaign, you'll be about level 40 or so uh, preparing to step towards the, the capstone dungeon. No worries though, completing the seasonal content will be available to you after you finish the campaign. But just know you have the option if you decide to skip the campaign, you totally can. Now that we've gone over the general structure of the difficulties and what you're going to be pro progressing through, let's talk about account-wide progression. This is where we're going to step into something called Renown. Renown is going to be that account-wide system that's going to buff all, your, all characters that you make. You're going 
going to look around the world for things called the Statues of Lilith, and you're also going to be completing things called Strongholds. Statues of Lilith are just going to be scattered in random places on the map. Take a look at the link in the description. I have a resource for you to take a look at for you to be able to find those easily. And each one that you do click on is going to give you some amount of stats. Anything you do in the game is going to add a little bit to Renown. You're now, gonna... you're able to get three levels of Renown while you're still on World Tier 1 or 2, depending on which one you're playing on. And then the final two of the renowned track are going to unlock after you get to world tier three. The character you're playing is awarded the top bonus listed under the renown level and the bottom level reward is applied to all characters you make in the future. And yes, this does apply to hardcore characters as well, so you can pass on some of the progress that your character makes before they rip. You can see a breakdown of values for what you get from each thing that you do. A shout out to strongholds being a hundred renown value. There's only three of them in each of the zones. So of course, focusing those first, is gonna give you a big burst of renown. Just a word of caution for players playing on hardcore, those are pretty difficult encounters. So just make sure you're going in there prepared. The events are scaled to be two levels above what your current character is. So if you're level 50, they would be level 52. One other thing I wanted to highlight too is the Altars of Lilith. The Altars of Lilith are going to have a lot of benefits for your account. Not only is this going to contribute to the Renown value, so it's going to move that progress bar up for the Renown, but also each Altar of Lilith that you interact with is going to give you some amount of stats. Now, as you're darting around the map, hunting down the Altars of Lilith, completing strongholds, just generally completing all renowned objectives, you're going to see a series of bonus objectives on your map, and some of them are going to have this ring of red highlighting them. What that is, is that this is the Tree of Whispers quests. Now, you're only going to see these if you decided to skip the campaign or if you completed the campaign. At that point, you're going to unlock the Tree of Whispers where you're able to complete Grim Favors to be able to get loot chests. Let's talk about the Tree of Whispers because you could actually target farm specific slots with this and then also get tons of loot through this system. First thing of which you're going to get to see the Tree of Whispers is the final quest you get after the campaign finishes. This is basically where you can complete Grim Favors to fill up a progress bar and Grim Favors are the value system that are going to increase your progress in the progress bar. You just want to be able to complete 10 Grim Favors to be able to get your reward. So right here, the Fetid Mausoleum here is going to give me five Grim Favors. The Grim Favors rewarded for the individual tasks are based on the difficulty of the task you're completing. For example, if you're doing one of the dungeons, it'll give you five Grim Favors. If you're doing a seller, for example, you'll get awarded one Grim Favor. And then there's a couple that fall within that spectrum. Just make sure that if your goal is to get Grim Favors, you are completing the highlighted objectives on the map. They're going to have a red ring around the objective, and it'll be very obvious that it's a contributor to the Grim Favor progress bar. There are still going to be events and dungeons and everything that, that are not going to contribute. This is kind of like a bounty system where it will pick select events that will contribute and they rotate on an hourly basis. So just keep an eye out on that and make sure if you are trying to farm this out again and again. And just to make it clear, this is a repeatable thing. You can fill up this progress bar as many times as you want. Uh, you just need 10 Grim Favors each time. My personal advice, I feel like it's worth it just to do the dungeon runs when they're available. With each one rewarding five Grim Favors, you just have to do two dungeons and you complete the Grim Favors and you can just head on back over. You'll be able to head back to the Tree of Whispers after finishing the progress bar to be able to get your reward. Upon completion of the Grim Favors taskbar, you can go back to the Tree of Whispers and your reward will be a choice of three different loot chests. Each of these loot chests have a theme to it. Each one will be themed after one of your armor slots or weapon slots, and all the items inside of it are going to be some quality of that armor slot. So for example, if you choose if you choose the glove box, then you're going to be able to get a bunch of gloves from the loot chest. Everything we've talked about so far is going to be taking you up closer and closer to level 50, where you go and complete the capstone dungeon. The first level 50 capstone dungeon is going to be here called the Cathedral of Light. You just head on in there. Once you're ready to fight, you're going to fight a couple bosses, ending with the pinnacle boss. Upon completion, you can head back to this statue right here in the center of Kiovashad to be able to adjust your world tier 
uh, to the new World Tier 3 option. You can also do this when you make a game or when you join on in on your character, you're about to log into Diablo, you can select over here what uh, World Tier you wanna play on as well. Congratulations, so if you've made it to World Tier 3, now we get a new system introduced to us that's called Helltide. So when we're looking to get into Helltide, what we're gonna do is, all right, so when we talk about Helltide, is that it's now gonna be active all the time. So there's always gonna be some Helltide affected area on the map. The main thing we're after when we're at Helltide is the Aberrant Cinders. The Aberrant Cinders are gonna be your currency that you're gonna to use to be able to open up certain chests that spawn in the area. There's several different types of chests. First, there's the Tortured Gift of Weaponry. These are gonna be in two types, light and heavy. The light one is gonna cost 125 cinders. The heavy is gonna cost 150. There's gonna be Gifts of Protection, which are gonna spawn for each of the armor pieces and they each cost about 75 cinders. And there's also one for jewelry as well. Jewelry is gonna spawn in as amulets or rings. The amulets are gonna be 125 and the rings are gonna cost 75. And the one we're gonna focus most on today is the Chest of Mysteries. Now, something you should know about Helltide is that you're gonna see all versions of the chests available on your map, including the Tortured Gift of Mysteries. Before this, they were invisible, but now you do get to see them. It's important to note that the Tortured Gift of Mysteries tend to have a better amount of loot in it than the other sources. And these are rotating chests that are gonna spawn in different locations a couple different times during the Helltide. So keep an eye out for these in particular as you're farming. Just keep in mind that when you open them, each of them do take 250 tormented cinders for you to be able to open them. There's another chest that's really important to know about. There's gonna be a tortured gift of living steel chest in the Helltide as well. If you head over to this location, you're gonna see that it's, it's gonna require 275 cinders to open this one. Generally, it is worth it to save up for these larger chests to be able to reap the extra rewards. Living steel chests are gonna award you five living steel with a chance to give you 10. Each other chest that you open during the Helltide, you're gonna get one living steel. And we'll talk more about what living steel is in the next section when we talk about the bosses that you can summon in Diablo 4. So yes, we can summon bosses in Diablo 4. And that's gonna be a big way of how you get those pinnacle pieces, the really big pieces called the Uber Uniques. But before we go into that, we do have to talk about a system called Nightmare Dungeons. Nightmare Dungeons are gonna be the place you wanna to go to when you're leveling from 50 up to 100, that, that space area there. Now the way that the power levels work on Nightmare Dungeons is that it's gonna be the tier plus 55. So 55 is kind of the base level. If you go into this, the minimum level of Nightmare Dungeon, you're gonna be fighting level 55 mobs, and then it's gonna scale up from there by one for each additional tier that you put on one of these sigils. These sigils originally are gonna just drop from while you're completing regular dungeons and, and working your way through the map, doing objectives. They're, you're just gonna to happen to find these, and they're gonna go into your sigil inventory on your character. Using one of these sigils is gonna activate one of these Nightmare Dungeons. Nightmare Dungeons are really important important for progressing your character's glyphs, which is another thing that's gonna fall for your character. These are things you can actually put inside of what's called your Paragon Tree. The Paragon Tree up here behind me is gonna be a scaling path. If you're taking a look at my build guide, you're gonna be able to follow the Paragon Tree that I have on there for the build, and it's gonna show you the path you should take. Each one of these nodes represents either stats or some affix, and some of these are gonna be empty sections where you're able to put a glyph in it that's gonna have the affix that the glyph has applied to your character if you meet the special requirements. So that's where you have to really plan your path and make sure you satisfy the subset of requirements, like getting a certain amount of intelligence intelligence nodes or strength nodes within the range of the glyph. Now, doing these nightmare dungeons is gonna increase the how far the glyph's range is. So you definitely wanna level up your, your glyphs as much as you can so that you're able to get as many of those affected nodes as possible. And the way nightmare dungeons are gonna work is that you're able to get to the end of the dungeon and then apply experience points to the glyph to level it up when, where it's actually gonna enhance what's on the glyph. You can craft sigils as well. Sigils are gonna come in several different types. First of all, this will sound familiar to you from how gear drops as well, but there's gonna be sacred and ancestral level sigils. Within the sigils, there's gonna be tiers that range from one to 20 for sacred, and then all the way from 20 to 100 
for the ancestral. Now we know this from earlier in the video that to determine the monster level that's going to be inside the sigil, we just add 54 to the tier level. Now something else that comes along with the different tier levels is that we're going to start getting more and more afflictions added to each of the sigils as we scale up the difficulty. Higher we go, the more afflictions we see. So for example, if we take a look at our, so if we take a quick look at a level five sigil, we can see that we have one positive affix at the very top that's highlighted in green, and then there's gonna be negative affixes that are applied to the sigil. And as we can see over here, we can get three affixes or afflictions applied to a level one to five sigil. Let's compare that to level 15. Level 15 has four affixes applied to it, and one of them is positive. Now, just a brief overview of which affixes you might want to avoid. That's gonna depend on your build to an extent, but from what I have found, the ones you don't wanna do are sling projectiles, potion breakers, and backstabbers. I haven't really found any other affixes standing out as being really threatening, but if you get multiple of those on a sigil, I would consider re-rolling it or crafting into a new one. On that topic, if you ever find a sigil that you don't want to run, and you can salvage the sigil. Salvaging is going to give you a certain amount of sigil powder. The amount of sigil powder you get back is going to depend on the level or tier of the sigil, and then you can spend this powder to craft sigils in the crafting section. Overall, it's a pretty simple system. You're basically just going to get a random number of afflictions each time you craft one of these, and you can always salvage the ones you don't want to run. So let's talk briefly about the summoning system in Diablo 4. You're able to summon a handful of bosses in Diablo 4 with varying rewards. First of all, you're able to summon a boss called the Beast in Ice. This is kind of a standalone boss that's going to drop higher item level gear and also has a chance of dropping some uber uniques. Those are the high pinnacle pieces that are very, very hard to find. Now, the Beast and Ice is not going to drop these as often as the pinnacle boss, the uber pinnacle boss, Duriel, um, which Duriel you're not going to fight until well past level 100, as in a, uh, your gear climb needs to go well past level 100. Um, but when you think about when to summon these bosses, the first one you're going to summon is going to be Varshan. Varshan, you can summon a world tier three or world tier four version. Generally around level 75, you can start summoning him. And then your ability to fight the world tier four version of Varshan is just going to depend on where your gear is at. You can do, he's going to be a viable option all the way throughout the end game because of how the uber boss works. So I would say about level 75 is when you can start challenging both Varshan and also Gregor. And I would wait until level 85 to do the Beast in Ice. Now the world tier four versions of both Gregor and Varshan, you probably want to wait until you're at a high power spike or if you're approaching level 100. You just want to make sure that when you spend your materials on these, at least this is the decision I made on this. When I spend the materials on doing these bosses, I want to make sure it's a successful run. World tier, when I'm doing the world tier three versions, there's not as much on the line as far as resources go. But for the world tier four versions, it does take more resources to fight them. So I wanna make sure, I wanna ensure success. So I tend to wait until level 100 because usually my goal with those bosses is to kill them and get the materials required to summon the uber boss Duriel. Let's talk about that really quick. So first of all, when you fight Varshan, he's gonna drop something called a, a mucus slick egg. You're gonna take this item as well as an item you get called a shard of agony from Gregor, and you're gonna take them down to you're gonna take them down to the gaping crevice at the bottom of your map. All right, now we're getting to something that is seasonal specific. Now, an another important part of making your character is you have to decide between two different servers that you might wanna play on. There's an eternal realm, and then there's also a seasonal realm. It's important to know that if you take part in the seasonal, our characters do get moved over to eternal after the season finishes. So the eternal realm is where all of our characters kind of collect, and as you create more characters for the new seasons and progress that way. Now, that's not saying that a player interested in only progressing one character and only playing one character can't just keep playing on the eternal realm there's nothing stopping you from doing that the only thing is though is that you won't get the new seasonal specific content that's only available to players that do play in the seasonal realm 
So just note that that's your that's the d distinction between those two different servers. If you do make a character on seasonal, just know it'll eventually be on eternal. So you'll be able to put it with your other characters that also expired after the season finished. Seasonal characters, you do get the choice of skipping over that campaign and jumping straight into the seasonal content. Of course, if it's the first character you ever made, you will have to play through a prologue. And then after that, you get to make your decision if you want to skip the campaign or not. You're going to gain access to a new currency that we can use to empower our character. Character, smoldering ashes. You can claim this in the free version of the battle pass. After acquiring these, we're gonna have a new feature opened on our battle pass where we're able to use season blessing. We can apply our season blessings to one of five categories. Boosted experience points, boosted gold, boosted salvage materials, boost duration of elixirs. In the battle pass, you're able to get 20 in total of these. So you're gonna be able to max out every one of these categories. I highly suggest using Urn of Aggression for your first urn to max out. Now, when it comes to Diablo 4 Seasons, there's always going to be a theme around it, some th big mechanic or, or change in the game that the entire season is going to be based on. So this season is called Season of the Construct. In this season, we have a Seneschal Companion. It's like a small robot guy that you're going to get very early on when you're completing the seasonal journey. Let's look at it from a high level. We're gonna have things called governing stones and tuning stones. Governing stones are gonna be basically the ability we give the thing, we can give it two of them. The tuning stones are going to be how it modifies that ability, how we can change it to fit exactly what we want. For those of us who have played Path of Exile, it's gonna be your skill gems versus support skill gems. Your tuning stone is gonna modify that ability. So in... for Season of the Construct, we're gonna get access to a zone called the Gate Hall. This is gonna act as your hub for all major things that you're going to be doing related to season three but it isn't restricted just to this zone you are going to be doing a lot of world quest stuff as well and we'll go into that in just a second but when you're in the gate hall you're going to see that you have access to an occultist the blacksmith and also a jeweler but when you head over to the jeweler you're going to see a new tab called craft construct items if you click on this you're going to get the option to create uncertain seneschal stone cash on creating this, you're gonna have to spend some of your shattered stones that you gained from fighting construct enemies in both arcane trimmers and the vault, and also some iron chunk. You can get this from salvaging any of your items to the blacksmith. After creating this, you're gonna be able to get a small cache, and just like in the name, it's uncertain exactly what you're gonna be getting. So here we got the tuning stone gripping, and also tuning stone devastation. Notice there's different rarities for the tuning stones. You can get unique ones, you can get legendary ones, and you also can get rare ones. So picking these up then is gonna add to the tuning stones you have available to your character. So if we go over to tuning stones, you can see we now have the legendary gripping support. Notice on the tuning stones too, it does mention, and this also goes to the governing stones, you have to collect 10 of them to rank it up. So you wanna collect copies of these to be able to rank it up to the next level. You're going to be able to get those through completing vaults, which are going to be the nightmare dungeon equivalent of dungeons available in uh, season three. However, before we head into the vaults, we want to do something called Arcane Tremors because we're looking for something called the Pearl of Warding that we're going to use to be able to give us an empowered effect while we're in the vault to make sure we get the max amount of loot possible. So we're going to look for the Arcane Tremors and where they're occurring on the world map. They're going to be not noted by the seasonal icon. You'll become very familiar with this icon. Anytime there's a seasonal event happening in any area in any season, you're going to see this seasonal icon icon so you can usually just follow that whenever you're trying to get the seasonal items consumables that kind of stuff so we're going to head on over to the arcane tremors and we're going to be looking to collect something called elemental cores these elemental cores are going to fall from the various pylons that are going to be in the area these are like the invasion entity you walk over to them and they're going to have traps going off you have to avoid the traps while interacting with the pylon to have it drop an elemental core you want to take three of these elemental cores and you're going to head on over to one of the brave and these braziers, once you interact with it, you're going to be able to use the elemental cores and also some of the, so just the broken parts item, you're going to be able to turn both of those in to be able to summon a Herald of Malthus. Fight the Herald of Malthus, and then he is going to drop the Pearl of Warding. We haven't talked about vaults yet, but you, you can also get these Pearls of Warding from the end of vaults as well. But let's go ahead and talk about how we can use them. Alongside Nightmare Dungeons, Season 3 has vaults. Vaults are trap-style dungeons where you have to get your way through the dungeon without getting hit by traps and dying to traps. There will be some enemies in there as well, but the main focus is on trying to get to the end and avoiding the traps put at you along the way to maximize your amount of rewards 
cards at the end. So at the start of where the vault begins, you're gonna see where you can exchange a pearl of wording for 10 charges of Zoltan's wording. When you exchange this, you're gonna notice that you get 10 Zoltan's wording added. The goal is to not get hit by traps because as you get hit by traps, you're gonna deplete part of Zoltan's wording. If you can maintain your wording by the end, you're gonna get an extra amount of loot from the chest. But by using one pearl of wording, Notice there's an extra chest provided at the end because I maintained one level of Zoltan's wording, at least one still on my character. And you can see when interacting the chest that it requires you to have that charge of Zoltan's wording before you're able to open it. This just adds the amount of loot that you're able to get from your dungeon or vault because you're able to maintain some of the wording. Now, is anyone still out there? I can't see because the internet's in my way. If you are here, I'm, I'm really impressed. Thanks for staying tuned. I really appreciate you staying to, to watch the whole thing. And I hope the video helped you out. Feel free to join my clan here, Gladius G. I'm looking for cool people to play with. And hey, man, you're pretty cool for sticking out the whole video. New players are more than welcome. Happy to have you. Happy to play with you. And everyone, if the video did help you out today, please rogue strike that like button. If you want to stay tuned for more Diablo content in the future, please bash the subscribe. I appreciate your time. I'll see you in the next one. Bye everyone.